Welcome to Trader Stock. The purpose of Trader Stock is to give you the truth of trading by interviewing top traders and give you different ways to trade the markets for consistent performance. So today's speaker that we have on Trader Stock is Steve Ward. Steve Ward specializes in helping people working in trading, investing, and banking to enhance their risk taking, improve their decision making and to achieve and sustain high performance by utilizing the latest science, research, and practice from performance psychology, decision science, neuroscience, behavioral science, physiology, and philosophy. Since 2005, he has provided specialized coaching, training, and consultancy services to investment banks, hedge funds, asset managers, commodity trading houses, utility companies, and proprietary trading groups across the globe. He's the author of Bulletproof Trader, Trader Mind, High Performance Trading, and Sports Betting to Win. It takes me immense pleasure now to welcome Steve. Hi, Steve. How are you today? Hi, Chiru. Great. Thank you. How are you? Yeah, very good. It's uh, We've all been looking forward to this um, interview, me, myself, personally, because I think psychology and trading is, um, is, is, is a very, very important topic for traders. And just before we get into the details, Steve, just a little bit background about you. So tell us a little bit about how did you get into the world of trading and, and into, um, you know, coaching traders on psychology and how old were you when you started? What event triggered your interest? Just just tell us a little bit. Sure. Um, so it was actually accidental, um, my entry into the world of trading. I was working as a sports psychology coach for a number of years and had a random encounter with somebody who was a keen tennis player, had been a professional tennis player and was at that time working as the head of learning and performance performance for a big international trading group and basically posed the question, uh, would I be interested in um, applying my, my sort of sports psychology skills to the um, professional traders that he was managing? And at that time, I knew very little, if probably anything, about the world of trading, um, but it sounded pretty curious. So he invited me up to the, to the trading floor. Uh, it was February 2005 non-farm payrolls day and I got to spend the afternoon there watching the traders trade over non-farm payrolls it's very interesting very intense 150 traders on the trading floor um, lots of emotion lots of energy and and probably the nearest the nearest I've been to a sports type atmosphere or event that wasn't um, a sports event so and then from that basically I was asked to then come in I mean I, I wanted to be there so I, I was keen to to engage they asked me if I'd come in and, and do three days a week, doing some coaching and, and some mentoring and some training, which, which I did do. And then really from there, it evolved. So um, by the middle of 2006, not long after the, the Winter Olympics in, in Italy in 2006, I was probably spending 80% of my time working in financial markets. And by the early 2007, I was probably pretty much 95% uh, or more in financial markets. So and that that's how it's really been since then. So it's banks, hedge funds, asset managers, uh, commodities trading houses, prop trading firms, beginners through to experienced traders, um, all the way through lots of different challenges, lots of different projects. So it, um, yeah, so it, was a, it was a random encounter, took me to a world that I knew nothing about that for the last 16 years really has been my, uh, my passion. Interesting, Steve. You know, to be honest with you, if all the people that we've interviewed and I've come is that I've never seen anyone say that they, they um, purposely, intently wanted to get into trading. It's a kind of always <laughs> been a little bit of accidental, you know? <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's, it's true. And you, and you know what? Even when I work with my um, professional clients, uh, many of whom are highly successful and experienced, it's, it's a common pattern there. There aren't that many who from an, from an early age definitely said, you know, trading is, is, is my, my path. Uh, many came into it through a variety of different ways later in life, which, which always interests me as well. 
Yeah, even me myself, I reflect on it. I mean, I, I come from pharmacology background and everybody, when they hear that, especially when we do our uh, workshops and our live trading is that, oh, how did you get from pharmacology to trading? It doesn't <laughs> make sense. But anyway, it proves the point. And also, you know, another thing that I always usually say is, it's always nice to see that beautiful orchestration, you know, when you look back on how everything just fits together, like what Steve Jobs says, you know, you but, but you can definitely see the dots connecting when you look back, you know, and see the yeah, beautiful sure. connection. I, I, think, I think one of the key things I've learned as well is um, having been certainly in the world of sports psychology and probably in my personal life kind of very goal-focused, very directional. I think it's over the years, as I look back, you know, it, there's, a, there's a need to balance that sort of, you know, here's where I want to be and who I, and who I want to be and, and very directively, but, but also leaving... Um, being open to opportunities that arise along the way that may be unexpected and being willing sometimes to explore, you know, the, the side path that, that, that suddenly appears on, on the journey and, and not being too fixed. Um, and not that all those paths always work out, but it's interesting sometimes how when you do look back, as you were saying, Tiro, and you start to look at, you know, the, the dots, that often there are things that you were, they were completely unpredictable. You know, you couldn't, I mean, I, did, I could not have envisaged when I was younger doing what I'm doing now you know it would have been completely outside the realms of possibility so it's so it's yeah interests me yeah definitely you know going a little bit into the type of traders that you've worked with this is really interesting you've worked with so many different variety of traders you know retail institutional mm -hmm. hedge fund commodity prop houses incredible so tell me is there like a common style of trading that you've seen in all the traders you've worked with or or they are variety like swing traders scalp traders position traders or have you seen a most majority falling into swing trading or, or whatsoever? No, completely mixed and all the way across the trading spectrum, really, too. So, it, I mean, I've got some traders. Well, some of my traders actually are obviously they're, they're, um, they're quants. Some of my clients, they're quants and they're using algorithms. So they're really the, the manager of a, of, a, of a trading system. Some of them are HFT. Some of them are, are, are more longer time frame. At the human level, I've got traders who are very high frequency day traders making hundreds of trades per day, so scalping. And then at the far end of the, of the scale, I've got some uh, asset managers that I work with who are very long-term investors, not probably in terms of multiple years, in terms of five to 10 years, but certainly in the maybe the one to two to three year range. So, uh, so all the way across, all different styles. I mean, I think you, know, you, get, you get this from reading market wizards and hedge fund wizards and and all these books is that there are so many different ways that you can express yourself in the markets and there's not a winning way of doing that and it really is i've observed this as much as i've read it it's really about the individual finding how to express their own strengths and their personality and their styles and their skills within the market and what it means is there won't be one way for everybody, much the same as in sport. Not everybody's a sprinter. Some people are sprinters. Some are long distance runners. Some are tennis players. Some are going to be basketball players. Some are swimmers. Some are extreme sports athletes. So there's many ways we can express ourselves in music, in sport, uh, in life, in general, in careers. And that's very true in trading. So I think, you know, it's important that people recognize that because once you've got the basics the goal really, as I see it in my work, is to help people to then go from a sort of a standardized approach to get them into the markets, into um, an individualized approach where they start to really work out how to make it work for themselves as an individual. Very nice. Very good. Very good to um, see that, you know, I mean, it's, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's so many variety of traders. And in fact, I remember this quote that Ed Top used to say in Market Visits once. He says, the market will always give you what you want. And I'm sure mm. we're going to talk a lot about that um, as we go through. So just a little bit, I want to ask you um, just off the book a little bit. I'm going to go into your book quite a bit more later on. But um, just on generically, we all know that Paul Tudor Jones had Tony Robbins coach him for many years. And uh, he used to pay him at least about at least about one to two million a year for the coaching that he did. Why would such a successful trader like Paul Tudor Jones have a psychology coach? And why, why would it be necessary? What would you actually say to that, um, Steve, just to set the context right, especially for some people listening in or going to watch the recording later on on like, what is the importance of psychology to trading? I know professionals would totally appreciate it.
but for beginners coming in and thinking about that, what would you say? Well, I think, and you're right. I mean, it's an interesting one. You know, why would the people at the top of the game be the ones really seeking out the coaching? It, it, it is quite interesting. Um, I mean, I'll tell a, a quick story first that I think highlights this point. I was doing some work for an investment bank. Uh, this is many years ago now, probably eight, nine years ago. Uh, and so it's still relatively early in terms of trader coaching. And we, we did a presentation to the traders at the bank. And then we set up a pilot program to coach a small number of traders to see how effective the coaching would be. And so we asked for volunteers for that, for that pilot program. Uh, and, and it was oversubscribed, so we had to make some choices. But what was interesting was at that time in the bank, there was a trader who was a young trader, uh, probably late 20s, highly successful, touted as being probably the best trader the bank had ever had. Now, he not only did he volunteer for the program, he went to his, his, his um, desk head at the end of our meeting and he basically said to him, put me on the course. You know, literally, I want to be on that program um, I don't want to be on like a waiting list, get me on the program, get me on the pilot um, as a matter of priority. Um, only one person out of the traders we presented to didn't volunteer to come on the pilot program. And he was the lowest performing trader, which is pretty interesting. Okay. Now, when I spoke to the, to the, to the trader, um, the, the, ex, the, 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 the um, successful trader about, you know, what was it that brought you to want to come on the coaching program? He said, I'm always looking for ways to improve what I'm doing. Mm. And if I come on the coaching program and I get just one thing from the program that helps me in some way, mm. then it's time well spent. Now that mindset of continually trying to improve of, you know, looking for opportunities to develop, not just in terms of strategy, not just in terms of skill, but also in terms of self, um, is a trait of high performers across all different domains. So, you know, high performers are generally pretty relentless in the drive to, to improve and get better. And they're also pretty restless in the fact that they are often dissatisfied that, with their current performance. They always kind of feel it could be better. So they're looking and they're open to, to learning and teaching across a spectrum of different skills and knowledge sets. So, I would say the reason why Paul Tudor Jones probably sought coaching was because he would be, as a high performer, he would have that mastery type mindset. He would know there would be ways to improve. And I'm guessing, uh, like many high performers, they tend to have high levels of self-awareness. Uh, awareness and high performance are very strongly linked. So with high self-awareness, and with brutal self-honesty, which has to come with that, people recognize there are areas where they can improve. They've got weaknesses that can be harnessed um, and they are then willing to invest the time and effort to work on that. So, so I think it's probably a fact that he had that mindset, that mindset I see in, in the majority of my clients, because obviously they're also self-selecting to come to coaching. And, and other people maybe just don't have that mindset. You know, they, they may be um, not as open or, or as willing to, to explore all the avenues for improvement, or maybe they are happier working on skills and strategy, but they've not yet got to the point where they've realized how important the mind and the body are, for example, in their performance and being willing to do the work in that area. See, very well um, summarized there, actually, Steve. You know, the, the honest truth is, across all professions, high performers will finally spend and invest time on themselves and especially on their mind and psychology. Because I think no matter what route you take, you finally come down to the same conclusion that all success first starts in your mindset and with the methodologies that you require to develop that elite performance mindset. So I think you nicely summarized it. I would like to quote at this point of Ray Dalio's um, point of where he was doing an interview and he said that trading above all professions and games is even more tougher than beating and winning in the Olympics. Now, based on that quote that Ray Dalio said, would you say then in line with him that because of that, trading above most professions would require a psychology coach? If yes, uh, why would you say that trading above any other profession would require psychological the challenge i mean i'm probably a bit biased um that, that i do believe that trading is uniquely challenging um and i'm also probably quite uniquely placed in terms of i've worked both with elite athletes at the olympic level and uh with elite traders so 
Um, what what is the challenge in trading? The challenge in trading uniquely is that we are taking risk under conditions of uncertainty. So so mentally and intellectually, that's that is challenging. You not only are you having to make those decisions, but also you also having to face up to and to deal with the consequences of those decisions, both if they win um, or if they lose, and there might also be multiple losses in a row. So we've got this uncertainty. There's, a, there's elements of uncontrollability. There's ambiguity. There can be also volatility. So the, the, the performance domain or the environment that traders operate in is very mentally challenging. So from that perspective, that's tough. Why else is it tough? It's tough also because in sport, uh, um, quite often there's, you know, if you're playing a football match, for example, uh, and we're, well, we're talking English soccer here, just in case the, the audience is international, but the game's going to be 90 minutes plus or minus, let's say maybe seven or eight. So, you know, whilst what go, goes on in the game has an element of kind of uncontrollability, there's still a known time frame when things will come to an end. And when we're trading, we don't have that. We don't know when it's going to start, when it's going to end. It is a kind of continual rhythm that we're intersecting into. And on a a day-to-day basis almost to the point um where it's six seven days a week so um i think you know certainly for some of my traders you you know they might be trading you know obviously five days a week for maybe you know 48 weeks sometimes more of the year whereas obviously in sport you have an in-season and an off-season there's kind of training preparation there's recovery so it can be quite relentless trading um and, and much like golf the challenge in trading is that there's lots of time to think about what's happening, uh, what you're doing well, what you're not doing well. So, you know, golf is a very mental sport and trading is a very mental activity that's probably closely aligned to golf in that respect. So I just think it's, it, it, it is challenging. And, you know, if you're doing it full time, um, that, well, I, think, I think one of the things is you can, you can make good decisions, uh, really good decisions, and you can get, a, a losing trade, you, know, you, you can get a bad outcome. And that's tough. You know, generally, if you're doing the right things in life, uh, you get rewarded. You know, and in trading, you could say, well, you know, I've had a bad month. I'm going to work even harder next month, do more research, work harder, work longer. But you might still lose money. So that's quite tough. You know, when lots of people, as we grow up, we kind of, you know, learn that, you know, you work hard, do the right things. And then you get, you know, you get good grades or you, uh, you know, achieve um, success in sports or chess or music and so on. If you practice more in music and you practice well, you get better at the instrument. But you can practice and, and, and improve in trading. And in the short term, down to randomness and, and, and uncontrollability, you may not see those efforts being rewarded. And I think the culmination of all of those factors makes it very, very, very difficult. Yeah, you know, it's interesting you say that because trading above most professions is very contrarian. It's not it's not a linear kind of a principle, isn't it? I mean, in most other things, yeah, you work hard, you know, you get a, a linear kind of a growth. But in trading, like you say, in the short term, you've got to endure the losses. And you, as, you, as well, you say it, Winning gives pleasure, but when you take a loss, it gives you twice as much pain mm. as, as, you, as you make in winning. I think that was very nicely put. And then you gave some really amazing um, techniques to, to overcome that too. And I think because of all of that, I would say, and just like what Ray Dalio says and what you have explained as well, that trading above most professions would require a psychology coach. So going on from there, Steve, then... Across all the traders that you have come across, what would you say are the three common challenges that traders face? There won't be too many surprises here, I don't think. But if we if we look at the ones that, that I guess are the most common that get written about the most, that I hear about the most, we'd have to definitely say there's something to do with you know dealing with losses, whether that be a loss, taking the loss on a trade or recovering from the loss or dealing with a sequence of losses. But there's something around that which is challenging for people. I would say on the flip side of that, a common challenge for many traders is holding on to winning trades. Uh, often traders are getting out of their trades too early. And then I think there's maybe something around, uh, let's call it kind of hesitating or, or not pulling the trigger. So, you know, a, 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 a setup um, arises in the markets and for whatever reason, the trader fails to take it um, 
or, or um, hesitates to take it. And I think maybe if I give a fourth that just quickly comes to mind on the flip side of that, maybe would be um, over trading. So where people are perhaps through boredom or through fear of missing out, taking trades that they shouldn't be trading, taking. So I think probably those four would probably most people would be able to look at their own trade and go, yes, I've experienced one of those four, if not probably all of those four at some time, if not actually um, quite frequently. Interesting. You know, just one a little bit small for the question on that. You know, you're talking about dealing with losses, holding on to winning trades, hesitating on taking a trade. How, when you have coached and dealt with traders, how would a trader know that He's at a point, let's say his strategy and his testing and his performance have told him that, okay, you are supposed to expect, you know, a three months kind of a drawdown. And let's say now he's gone through the three months of a drawdown. He's waiting for that fourth month. Where is that line where he says, you know what, the strategy is not working or it's something to do with his psychology? How, how will he gauge that? Yeah, it's a good question too. So it's, it's a tricky one because um, the challenge always in trade, well, the challenge in trading is working out what's changed. So, you know, if a trade has been getting some sort of consistent type results, so let's make that assumption that that's been happening. And then there's a, a turn in those results. In this case, it's a downturn. The question is, is it just down to, you know, sort of the randomness and, and, the, and the luck factor that occurs within the markets i.e it's perfectly normal there's no need to change anything it, you know eventually you know i'm flipping a coin i'm getting a load of tails but if i keep flipping it you know heads is going to come back again or is it down to the fact that something has changed which is influencing the outcomes i'm getting and, and in simple terms if we think about trading being a combination of there's the trader doing the trading there's the markets they're trading and the combination of those two is giving them an outcome for me, the question is, if the outcome has changed, what, what's led to that change? And it can only really be a change in market conditions or a change in what the trader is doing at the behavioral level that might be driven through some sort of psychological shift or change. So I think this is, this is why it's really important because it's not always easy to, to decide exactly when that point is or what the point of change is. But it's easier for traders to do that if they are consistently evaluating and monitoring their trading if they're looking at what's happening in the markets if they're consistently looking at you know how they're trading execution of their trades um, if they're looking at their own kind of uh, physical state mental state emotional state so if traders are continually assessing and evaluating themselves and they're likewise doing that with the markets and then through a trading journal of also looking at their trading results if they're seeing a shift in their results either up or down in all fairness then they can and start to look at well, what's happening within me and all within the markets that might be able to explain why what is happening is happening. And then is there any action that might be useful to take? The challenge for many traders is, um, or not the challenge, but the, the fact for many traders is they don't keep um, detailed or, or useful enough records to be able to kind of keep that awareness of where the shifts are occurring to catch them early enough. So most people only start to evaluate or to look back to find out what's wrong when they've already gone quite a long way through the drawdown period uh, and really we want to be a bit more um, finely tuned so we can start to notice any deviation away from the norm much earlier yeah very nicely said i think that's where most traders fail because you know when they go through the drawdown yes even though theoretically they might know yes you know they go to three months of drawdown and they also are prepared maybe sometimes even to get two times the drawdown of what they've tested just to account for market conditions. But, you know, just like nicely you said, Steve, it's like sometimes the emotions get overcome you such that you lose your awareness and then you forget to do your continuous monitoring and self-checks to see how you're performing and where is the cutoff point. So I totally um, understand what you're saying in, in terms of that. I think the key, I think what you've mentioned again and again in the book, and you've described some really nice methodologies as well there, which we'll go into detail later on, on how you can keep this self-awareness there and keep your focus on action. So that was really, really um, good and focus on the 
process. But before we come on to that, I just want to ask you, just on the contrary of the three challenges that I asked you on traders face, what would you say then would be the three main reasons why traders succeed? Oh, good question. Um, okay, let's have a think if we get down to three. Well, we've definitely got to think about they're going to need, let's call it maybe um, competent. And let's, what does that mean? Let's say they need to have a good level of skill and a good level of knowledge about obviously, you know, whatever they're, they're trading and how markets work and about themselves. Um, and, and let's put within that heading as well to try and keep it down to three. Let's also put under their strategy. So there's a skill level, there's a knowledge level, and there's then some way of deploying that skill and knowledge within the market. So some kind of trading strategy, ideally with some kind of edge. So let's call that kind of one chunk to work on. And actually, I think that's probably for, for most traders who are newer to the markets. That's where you need to be spending your time is developing the skills, the knowledge, the understanding, getting a good strategy in place that kind of feels right. So um, next to that, I would say let's probably think would be capital management, risk management, position sizing, something around that skill set. Um, because that's what's going to stop a lot of newer traders from progressing is they're just going to burn through their cash, their capital too quickly. They're going to take big losses that are going to be quite traumatic for them. are going to be hard to recover from. So, so you need to have really good risk management uh, and money management in place. And then thirdly, I'm going to say, and again, this might be my bias here, uh, but I'm going to say something around the psychology or the mindset, but basically having the, the psychological and the physiological states that allow you to execute your strategy consistently because it's not just knowing we you know everyone who's traded knows this um, but the, the challenge is that it's not knowing what to do that is difficult you know for most people we can read a book we can go on a course we can understand conceptually what we need to do the challenge in trading is being able to do what we know in the heat of the moment in the market when there's the uncertainty the uncontrollability, when maybe doubt creeps into our mind, when an emotion shows up or we get a difficult sensation in the body and then we still have to take action. And I think you know, that the gap between knowing what to do and doing what you know you should do is often a psychological gap for many people in some way. So yeah. competence, capital management and psychology, I guess would be my, my sort of three big chunks. Yeah, very true. In fact, you know, interesting that you said all of that. I mean, as it is in the trading game, finding an edge and an edge that sustains is already difficult, you know, and that's the competency. And then, of course, capital management itself, I mean, to pull it off ties in with the psychology and that even makes this game harder and goes back to the first question that we asked and what Ray Dalio said. It, it reinstates the more the point why you would need a psychology coach, especially in um, trading. In fact, in reading your book, Steve, you had mentioned about the um, psychological and physiological. You talked about the four-part framework for bulletproof trading, is it not? Um, yes, that sounds correct. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I always get really nervous when people start quizzing me about the book because you write. It's a, it's a strange thing. You kind of write them and... Uh, when you're writing it, you're, you're deeply in it and you're writing it and you kind of know everything about the book. And now it's been out for six months. Um, and also you don't tend to read it once you've written it. So yes, there's know. bits that you forget and then people ask you these <laughs> questions and you're suddenly thinking, you know what? I should know the answer, but I'm not that sure. So um, I believe there's four pillars. Yes. Yeah. Um, listen, no problem on that. I'm sure the readers will be reading that, you know, they'll be getting it and we're telling them how to get the book as well later on, but they can definitely go and find out the full part. But I must say there was really nice models that you gave inside the book and uh, throughout the book as well, which, um, which I wanted to ask you a little bit as we go to the next section. But uh, just one more I wanted to ask. Okay. Yeah. This, this is an interesting one you can reflect on as well. Let us know what you say on this. In your whole experience with dealing with retail institutional hedge fund managers, who would you say was your most toughest client and how did you help him overcome his challenges? Oh dear. Um, I've had a lot. Um, <laughs> right. That's, that's for sure. Um, 
I'll tell you the, I, I will come to one in a moment. I have got one that's come to mind. Um, but I think, to be honest, I would say in most cases, um, because traders are typically coming to coaching, the majority, let's say it's 80 percent are coming because they're having a difficult situation. It's always tough because um, they're generally in a situation where performance is not good. They've generally left it too late. So, you know, lots of people have come to you for help when they you know, need it the most, but they haven't come early. So again, it's that, it's that key factor. It's got bad, it's got even worse. It's got so bad that they must go for coaching. Uh, whereas ideally, we'd want them to be having coaching all the way through to, you know, again, to catch things early. So they're often coming when things are tough. So the challenge is why it's difficult for me often in coaching is you're trying to get people out of a hole that's quite deep. And of course, they want to get out of that hole pretty quickly. And there's not always from a deep hole, a quick fix. So it's generally tough. 20% come to coaching because they're doing well and want to do better or they're doing well and want to sustain. That's probably slightly easier to work with. But the, the, one, I, the one I'll come to as maybe the toughest, um, and it's probably within a collection of, of similar cases, but was a very successful trader doing very well, had done for a number of years. And then there were some changes in the markets that he was trading, which essentially meant that his trading strategy, which had brought him success for roughly a 10 year period, was no longer working. And the way the market was being structured and changing, it was not going to work going forward. So that's tough because A, for the first part of the process, the trader is trying to keep doing the same thing even though he knows the market conditions are not conducive to that. It's almost a bit like a denial phase. Um, then they realize, you know, it's getting so bad, they've got to do something. And then they come for coaching. So you end up, or I ended up with this person who was a very skillful, knowledgeable, successful trader, had gone from having a really phenomenal kind of 10th year of his career, was now in like year 11, desperate, uh, really struggling, very down, and then kind of on the on sort of the boundaries of year 11 and 12 in his career was now doubting, you know, maybe I was just lucky for those 10 years. Um, am I really skillful? Can I really do this? Do I want to keep doing it? Because also if, you, if you're used to making money and then you stop making money, um, it's not as enjoyable. Um, and so part of the process really was trying to, I mean, it's multiple parts, but some key things we had to work on together were, you know, really um, helping him to understand that, that he had this existing skill set and knowledge set and these capabilities that we could leverage elsewhere, but also accepting the fact that things had changed. They were not probably going to go back to how they were and you know what the options were. The options were, yes, you could give up trading or you could try to trade something differently or you could try a completely different market or you could change your style. So we looked at all the different options. Um, then we had to try and obviously, from my perspective, it's not for me to tell the trader what to do. So we're trying to, you know, look at the options that, we, that, that he can take. Uh, he decided he wanted to carry on trading uh, and to try and make a success of it. But then we're in this situation, which is difficult, where you've got someone who's used to making money regularly, who now is not making money. And when you're learning a new market and you're learning, you're, almost, you're not going back to the beginning again, because also you've got a lot of existing skills and knowledge. But when you start to learn a new market, um, you can't have the same expectations as you had when you were like the master in terms of knowledge of a market. So mentally, you've got to go back and you're trading small size. So now you're, you're trading small size, you're learning a new market, you're making mistakes, you know, you're, you're, you lose a bit, you make a bit, if you make a bit, you're making small, you know, you, you, the, the money you're making is a lot lower than it normally is. Um, it's a slow period, you know, people think, oh, that's okay, you know, it'll be a week or two and I'll be back game again this went on for months Tira. i'm talking about probably realistically almost a year oh, before wow. he got back to where he was before so in total the transitionary period was maybe two years um so you've got to keep as a trader you've got to kind of keep going you've got to persevere you've got to stay motivated you've got to believe you're going through this change process all the time, the mind's going back to the good old days and how it used to be. Will it ever be the same again? You start to doubt yourself. Um, and lots of traders I've coached who've been in similar situations um, have found that transition very difficult and not everybody makes it. So he was in a way tough as a client because it took a long time to get him back to a high level again. 
Uh, but in a way, he was a good client to work with because he was so committed. So when we were doing the work together, he, he, did, the, you know, he did the work that needed to be done to give himself the best chance of getting back. Because the reality is, neither of us knew for sure if he would ever get back to any kind of level that he'd been at previously. And that, again, this is one of the challenges of trading. Going back to our earlier questions is when you're making a trade or you're progressing in trading, you've got to kind of have full commitment to the process and doing what needs to be done. But there's no guarantee of success. That's pretty tough. Oh, there's a lot of um, important words that you just mentioned there. I think one is the transition, right? I mean, because something has been working for so long. First of all, you don't let go of it because a kind of an attachment, a habitual routine has been formed over there. So you need to unlearn that and then relearn new stuff. And in fact, interesting enough, Steve, it's that this is what's happening throughout the entire globe as we speak now because of this Mm. pandemic. Mm. I mean, a lot of not only I mean traders, I mean, a lot of business professions have now got to unlearn what they were used to and relearn new stuff and go on to online, go on to work from home, you know, go on to getting more used to technology and software. So we totally understand what you're saying, isn't it? I mean, it's just the adaptation, adaptation to, to, to what is happening. And especially in trading, I would usually say, I mean, maybe because I've been trading for so long as well, I'd be biased and say that in trading, I think it's more difficult because things change even more faster, yep. right? I yep. mean... It's, 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 not, it's, it's, not, it's not that easy. No. I know the balance because there's, the, um, there's the need to be flexible in the short term. So obviously the market conditions can change on a, on a daily, weekly, monthly mm-hmm. basis. And you want to have that flexibility around whatever your style is. But over the longer term, you have to be adaptable. Um, and when I first came into trading in 2005, um, there was a, a sort of a, a transitionary period where traders had come from the pits onto the screens sort of during the late 90s, early 2000s. And due to the uh, inefficiencies in the markets, many of those traders were making great money. But by the time 2005 into 06 rolled around, the markets were becoming much more efficient. And so traders that had been making really great money were suddenly struggling to make any money. Um, And then the question is, you know, what do I do? Like when the pit traders, when, when it went from pit to electronic, it's do I... You know, what do I do? It's a transition and not everybody makes it. You know, it's, mm. it's basically it's you adapt, you evolve um, or, you know, in, in brutal terms, you die, you know. And then in 05, 06, I saw that transition again. Uh, and I've probably seen it two or three times since then, where in different forms of markets have shifted or changed. And large groups of traders have been faced with the decision of do I work through this and try to adapt um, or do I go away and do something different? And that's the reality, as you said, you know, I think in the world at the moment, it's a case of, you know, that the world is transitioning. We're in a, in, a, in a bit, the context has shifted significantly for many of us. And then it's looking around, you know, what's the short term flexing we need to do. But also mm. the reality may be for some of us, there might be a long term adaptation required, which might be within the roles we're doing or might be outside of those roles. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's challenging. Change for humans is generally challenging anyway. So um we're just trying to what i'm trying to do as a coach is i'm trying to support people through that change process Mm -hmm. as effectively as possible you know nicely you 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 touched on another word you know in in terms of all these changes and do you stick to this or do you do something else you know all that fundamentally comes down to one thing and which you nicely kept repeating inside the book which is commitment Mm. commitment to the path and you mentioned this again just now in in, in yep. this talk over here commitment again and that's why we we touch on this quite a lot as well like base camp workshops and everything we always tell the traders to identify what what is actually their purpose what what's mm. what's their life purpose first and how does then trading fit into that life purpose you know yeah. and because you see as you and I know we've discussed a lot of this and a lot of books have been written trading is not an easy game but once you've got the age right and once you can consistently do it, it's a highly rewarding game. And But you can only stick to that if there's commitment. And I think that's exactly what you kept writing inside the book. And it's a it's an important principle, I would say, throughout life and throughout any even life. Is it not true? Yeah, agreed, true. And I think what, what um, the importance of purpose or, or meaning, however we want to define it, 
is that anything that's meaningful um, and rewarding is probably going to be difficult, is the reality. And anything that is difficult is probably difficult because it's uncomfortable. So it might be that we experience thoughts or emotions or sensations that are uncomfortable. And that's just part of that, the, the pursuit of that, of that, um, on that path as such. So why does purpose and meaning become so important once we start off in a direction towards something that is meaningful and worthwhile doing if it is going to bring discomfort which it which it will i would say 99 point something percent of the time then when it's uncomfortable what do we do the human system will crave comfort over discomfort so when we're put into a situation where it's potentially going to be uncomfortable our default setting is basically flight to comfort. Um, and now the challenge with that is that the flight to comfort often means that we engage in behaviors in trading, which reduce our returns. And in terms of life, take us away from achieving our, our full uh, potential, becoming our best self. So how do we mediate? How do we balance the discomfort? What do we do? What offsets the discomfort is purpose. So if you've got a a clear and defined and compelling purpose, a meaning, um, a set of values that really matter to you, then in those moments where it's uncomfortable and the, and the body is basically choosing, shall we go for comfort or discomfort? What can help it to go for making the uncomfortable choices is if those uncomfortable choices are attached to achieving something meaningful or purposeful. So I think it's really important that... Um, that all of us, but especially in trading and investing, that we're clear about purpose, we're clear about the values, who we want to be um, as traders, as investors, because in those moments of discomfort, that's where we can mediate that flight to comfort, uh, which is uh, in, in trading returns can be highly destructive. You know, and I talk a lot about in the book, but in, in my work in general, about one of the key factors in becoming successful in trading is developing a willingness to be uncomfortable because mm -hmm. uncertainty is uncomfortable. Taking risk is uncomfortable. Uncontrollability is uncomfortable. You know, losing is uncomfortable. Staying in a winning trade is uncomfortable. So, you know, there's lots of discomfort that occurs in trading. You can't get rid of it. We can certainly reduce it by, with some good practices, but you can't eliminate it. And often I think some people are playing a game where they're trying to trade with kind of a, a zero level of discomfort. But the reality is everything they're doing to stay comfortable in the short term is reducing their returns in the long term. So the only way that you can really get your optimal long term returns is if you are willing to experience discomfort in the short term. You know, I, I must say that that's one of the biggest driving points of the Bulletproof Trader book that you had written, which was, you know, you got to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. You can't avoid the uncomfortable, but you got to get good with it. The same thing with stress. You can't avoid it, but you just got to get good with how you manage the stress. And I think yeah. that was one of the really um, main, very, very good striking points, especially with trading. You, you have to get really good at that. Um, just a quick one question that I want to touch on before we go on to the other ones, which is, um, you know, Steve, with, with all the traders that you've worked with, would you say that some of their or most of their trading patterns come from behavioral patterns that they've gotten from childhood or society? And if yes, do what kind of techniques do you do to um, help them overcome it? I mean, do you use some kind of hypnosis or deep, you know, meditative um, exercise? So how, so how, so just enlighten us a, a bit on that. I mean, firstly, I mean, does the behavioral patterns come from childhood? And if yes, you know, what kind of techniques do you use? Do you use hypnosis or any other techniques? So our behavioral patterns that we're expressing in the markets will be a reflection of what I would call in my work, our learning history. So from the moment we're born through to the moment that we're having this conversation right now, we've had a learning history. So, you know, we've learned languaging, uh, we've learned, you know, what we might, our, our belief system, how we view the world, how we view people. And then as we start trading, we start to form beliefs about, you know, the markets and how markets move and, and what's good or bad. You know, are we technical? Are we fundamental? Is it both? So as we're evolving through life, we are collecting this learning history. 
And that learning history then plays out in our behavior. So some of that comes from childhood, but some of it also comes from our early trading experiences. It comes from college, you know, from school, from the friends we keep and so on. So at any given time in the market, essentially, yes, what we are seeing in our behavior is a playing out of the learning history, which could be generic or could be very trading specific. So in, in my work, when I'm coaching traders, I, I don't use psychoanalysis. We don't go you know, we're not, we're not looking to go into the past to try and resolve things in the past for the future, but we, I, I'm often curious just about how they got to where they're at, just the kind of the path where they've taken to kind of get a sense as to kind of who they were and, and who they, how they've become, who they've become as such. So, so but for me, um, whilst I'm trained in hypnosis and multiple other different psychological interventions, I, I don't use a lot of that. When it comes to changing trading behavior, and I've actually been doing some work with a client just early today around this, a lot of my work comes from an area called contextual behavioral science, which, which is a, a newer psychological form. Um, it has a, 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 a branch of it, which is called third wave cognitive psychology. So it's kind of an updated version of, of CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. But one of the key principles um, of that methodology is that we can't unlearn. So, you know, once we've had this learning history, we can't unlearn what we've learned already. So, you know, if there are neural pathways in the brain, you can't eliminate those. Those neural pathways will stay there. But what we can do is we can learn and we can build new pathways and we can build new pathways that provide us with new behaviors which we can then start taking in the future, which means we don't need to use the ones that we had there in the past. So in my work, it's much more about kind of identifying what the patterns are, which of those patterns are useful and which of them are not useful. And then for the ones that are useful, also we do, we just let them run their natural course. And then for the patterns we identify that are not helpful, we might look at kind of um, what it is within that, you know, is it a thought process? Is it an emotion? Is it a sensation? What's kind of um, occurring in that situation? And then we would look to build um, through awareness and then through practice to build new behaviors for that specific situation that the trader wants to improve in. So for example, with the client earlier, part of their challenge was hesitating um, in taking trades. And so the challenge is they've got a learning history which has led to them uh, getting very good at hesitating to take trades. We can't unlearn that. You can't just delete it. So what, but what we can do is build practices, um, mental training techniques where we can help that, that person to practice and to develop the ability to um, execute trades um, with less hesitation. And then through the practicing of that, and this is, you know, this is about commitment and it's about being able to manage your mind and manage the emotions and overcome what's getting in the way. But the more that person takes those trades with less hesitation, they essentially are learning now to take trades with less hesitation. And if they're doing that, then by nature, they're not hesitating. So we don't need to unlearn hesitating. We just need to learn not hesitating. So that's my, in, in a nutshell, that's kind of basically how I work with my clients. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So basically new practices just to um, replace the old ones, not even replace, I mean, just to overcome them basically, um, um, if, if I would use the right word. And what yeah, just, the... just, just, just to give them a choice to really. So, you know, it's like, here's how you used to do things. Mm -hmm. um, and now we just want, we want to give you the skills to be able to, in the moment, um, unhook from what was keeping you in kind of those old ways and to have the choice to do something differently and then have the commitment to do something differently in that moment and then to repeat that over and over and over again until that becomes the way that you do things. Great. You know, just touching on that, we go into the next question, which is, you know, in your Bulletproof Trader book, uh, you, in terms of unhooking, as you just mentioned, mm -hmm. one of the um, practices you mentioned was about being the witness or being the observer principle. Yeah. And in fact, I think um, that is very striking to me because we have done videos on that because you see our... Our, our unique thing also here is that we've used a lot of uh, spiritual principles and integrated that into trading. And I saw that coming into your book as well. And especially you made a lot of reference to uh, 
the Greek philosophy of Stoicism. Is that right? And, stoicism, yes. Yeah, stoicism. Yes, yes. And um, a, a lot of principles come in alignment with a lot of other religious scriptures or spirituality. The principles are all the same. You know, you, you've talked a lot about letting go of the outcome, focus on the process, accept what you cannot control. And then finally, this um, observer principle, which I found mm. really quite um, powerful. In fact, I always remember Tom Basil, which he had also quoted in the book as well, talking about this as well, like being a witness um, to all the events that the movie so that you're always detached from your emotions and can execute flawlessly. Uh, would you like to comment a bit more further on this? Yeah, sure. So the yeah, so stoicism was something I, I really got into probably while I was writing the book because the, the Bulletproof Trader book specifically around kind of dealing with the challenges of, of trading. And Stoicism is a 2,000-year-old philosophy mm -hmm. that was basically developed to enable people to have the skills. So it's a practical philosophy to give people the skills to deal with the hardships and uncertainties of life. It's also, interestingly, a lot of modern-day cognitive psychology is founded around some of the 2,000-year-old Stoic principles and practices. So, uh, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really great area area to, to kind of have awareness of. Um, now, in terms of the observer principle, so this has come really from my work in, in both uh, mindfulness, but also in, in what's called acceptance and commitment training, where there's a, a big piece of that is around developing this ability to be the observer, uh, to be the noticing self. So you know, when we're having a, a thought, for example, there's a part of us that's having the thought and there can be the part of us that's noticing that we're having that, that thought. You know, there can be a part of us now that's doing the breathing and there can be a part of us that's observing the breath as we're doing the breathing. So we've got this observer self. And it's, it's, for me, it's really powerful because we talk a lot about, you know, discipline in trading. And discipline is essentially about, you know, we, we know what we want to do and we want to be able to do that in real time. So we need an awareness of what's happening while it's happening, because we can't regulate ourselves. We can't we can't manage our behaviour or our emotions or our thinking unless we've got an awareness of them. So we need to be able to notice what's happening while it's happening. We need this present moment awareness, which which I draw upon a lot from kind of mindfulness based practices to do that and develop it. Um, and so for me, yeah, the, the noticer is about developing this ability, um, this observer self in neuroscience, sometimes called the impartial spectator, where we can, in, in a sense, be aware of what's happening as it's happening, such, you know, I'm noticing I'm having the thought that. So it might be, you know, for my, for my client earlier, um, who would often have a thought, uh, this is not a good setup. So the, the trade was set up, it is a good setup, but then there'd be the part of them that would try to keep them out of the trade. This isn't a good setup. So that's a thought that comes into the mind and it's a, it's a, pop, it's a, a common thought for them, uh, but it's not helpful. But if you can move that to, I'm noticing my mind is having the thought that this is not a good setup. Now we can start to notice that it's a thought that our mind is having, as opposed to when we say to ourselves, this is not a good setup. It feels like it's a fact. And so we can become very reactive to that. So this ability to notice a thought, you know, I'm noticing I'm having the feeling of fear of losing on this trade is different to I'm afraid of losing money now. So once we can start to get this bit of distancing away from our experience and, and get into the observer and notice a self, it's a very different place to make uh, decisions from and actually it's a point where we can be more flexible in our behavior and that's a key part in my work is giving people the ability to be flexible such that we are not reactive to what's going on in our experience but that we can be aware of what's going on externally in the markets we can be aware of what's going on internally within ourselves. we can assess those two and then we can respond appropriately according to our overall trading strategy yeah, you know, very well summarized. In fact, it's it's explained much more in um, in detail in the book. And those of you guys listening in and going on to read the trader book, I'll definitely tell you all to pay attention to that part on the observer principle because, like you said, Steve, it's it just gives you 
more awareness and with more awareness your decision making skills make uh, gets more precise and and less regretful when you look later on it becomes more in the moment if 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 you were to say it in exactly the, in that, that. And, and I've done this with, with, with many clients. I've taught these skills many, many times. And when they're practiced a lot, I mean, Tom Basso, I think, in Market Wizards talked about, you know, there's a Tom Basso in the corner of the room watching the mm-hmm. Tom Basso uh, mm-hmm. uh, the trading screen, which is great. But I've had clients say to me, it feels like I'm behind the chair, the trading chair, watching myself. Mm-hmm. And it's that kind of experience. So it's, uh, it's not about being detached, but it's about having some distance. So it's not about being emotionless or not having these thoughts, but it's about being aware of the emotion, being aware of the thought, being aware of the impulse or being aware of the urge, but not having to act on it, but just recognizing it's there and having the choice of, and do I want to act on it or not? And it's the choice that then allows the flexibility, which for me is a big separator psychologically from the very best traders, maybe from those who are maybe lower down. Spot on, and I think that distancing is what leads to better management, better management of your responsiveness rather than reactiveness. You know, so um, re- very beautifully, you know, put into the book. Just the last part before we, I know we got about just a few more minutes, running out of time, but just the last part is just on in terms of practices. So we've talked a lot about you know all the um, techniques. We've touched a little bit on techniques as well. If there were one or two practices that you would like to impart to all our clients listening in um, what would they be I know in the book you've talked a little bit about breathing exercises you talked a lot about you know awareness and observer principles if there were anything that they can start off small maybe let's say you know just on a routine basis would there be anything that you would recommend as a pre-trading or a post-trading routine Uh, in terms of pre-trading I would say there's a few things that would be good to do Um, So it's really about, you know, how you turn up at the screen is really important. So I think, you know, within that, um, and as a bit of a checklist here, but the first thing is, you know, when when you get to your screen, just take a minute and just take a few slow, deep breaths with full awareness and just kind of settle into the screen and drop into the moment as it is. Because many people are coming to their screens. Maybe they've either been at work or been somewhere else. I mean, we want to kind of almost go into neutral and reset. So I say... Take a minute or two just to reset, drop into neutral, focus on the breath. Once you've done that, I think it's really important to remind yourself of of what it is you're trying to achieve in that trading session. So it could be just, you know, you might read through your trading plan or you might have some kind of key points that you want to really focus on, you know, doing well in that particular trading session. Then I would say also think about who you want to be as a trader to kind of get a sense as to kind of, you know, what strengths and what qualities you want to bring to the markets in that trading session could be discipline could be focus um, could be creativity could be flexibility whatever feels right for the person Um, and I think it's always good in that preparation or two other things to add into that one would be something around reminding yourself or making a commitment to being willing to be open to the discomfort that the trading session might bring so kind of upfront acknowledge the fact that there might be situations that are going to be uncomfortable and you're going to commit to taking action even though it's uncomfortable so prepare for that in advance and probably alongside that maybe do some um, if then scenario planning so lots of traders you know plan a trade um, but what they what they fail to think about is that there are multiple possibilities as to how the market might move so the, the the trade that you would like to happen is one avenue but there are multiple other possible ways that the market might move such that that trade does or doesn't happen or once you're in the trade, what might happen when you're in the trade. So I think, you know, thinking about scenarios and you know, if this happens, then I'll do this. If this happens, then I'll do this. If this happens, then I'll do this. But I think that type of thinking is really important because it reduces attachment to the trade having to go in one particular way. Uh, which is important, but it also means if the market does do something differently, you've already prepared for it. You know, you've already considered it. It's not going to throw you as much as it would do. It's not a completely uncertain, unknown event. You've already thought about what you're going to do, so you can be a bit more responsive. And I think you know, it, it also acknowledges the fact, you know, in terms of probabilities that um, there are many different ways this could go, such that if it doesn't work out as planned, we don't get to um, disrupted by that because we've already assumed from the beginning that there were multiple different paths that the market 
if and therefore the trade could follow. Very well said about the what if. In fact, you know, um, with most of the trading strategies that we do in our live trading room and all of that, I mean, we have made our whole approach quantified for all the what if scenarios. So it's 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 a lot of the work ha- has been done, but of course, but still, you know, like you say, to to execute in real time and then to manage your emotions. Now that that's the thing that needs to be practice with all the um, techniques that you've talked about in the book. Steve, it's 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 really incredible. I, I must say that, you know, all the points we've covered here and the more depth that you go into in, in the book, the book is definitely a must read. Uh, guys, anybody listening hesitate, I mean, just go for it um, immediately. I mean, I would recommend that to all retail traders and all institutional traders as well. I just finished up writing the book review for that um, as well for the Bulletproof Trader as well, Steve. Just, you know, one Last thing for everyone listening in is where's the place that they can go to find out more about you? Uh, for people who are institutional traders, the best place would be uh, performanceedgeconsulting.co.uk. And then for those who are on the retail trading front or private traders, I would definitely uh, recommend tradeatyourbest.com, which I think Thierry's just got up on the, uh, or is that the performance edge you've got on there? I oh, know trade at your best. So yeah, trade, trade at your best. best. Yeah. yeah, that's, and that's the sort of the, the platform there for um, resources and courses to support the, the retail or, or the private trader. So that's a good place to go. Okay, and let me just also show them also the place where they can get also your your book as well. And I think um, Harriman has also given us uh, a discount code that you guys can use. Let me just put this in uh, chat box as we're speaking. And as we are sharing with you that, if you all have any questions at all, please just put it into the chat box. Uh, then I can also then share this with you. Let me see if I stop the share would that be more easier okay good so let me just put in this links over here that's for the book and the discount code as well okay and then your place to find out more about steve and don't worry if you're not getting it at the moment i mean we'll be also sending out an email with all the um recording as well as the place to find out more about um, Steve. Okay, so I think all the links are all there. And also, um, Steve, is there anything else that you want to just um, let the audience know before we conclude? Um, Only if people are interested in developing their psychology further, then um, I started last year. It was a bit of a first. It was a pandemic opportunity. Um, I actually launched a Um, online training program psychology course for retail and private traders specifically Uh, I've not had the chance to run one since 2014 just down to travel schedule and workload and obviously that was a bit different last year so it um, we ran it um, last year it's very very successful and um, as a result we're going to run that again it's probably going to be middle of April through till uh, probably end of May. It's about six, seven weeks long. So it's called Trade at Your Best is the course. And all the details will be on the Trade at Your Best website on the course page, which I think Tiro is scrolling through there. Yeah, on I think the this screen. is the one that, uh, yeah. that you're talking about, that's isn't it? it? Yeah. 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 It's going to change a bit, actually. That, that's that's the, the sort of the, the content from, from last year's. I'm going to update it, review it. And um, it will be similar with a few um, upgrades and improvements ready for the 2021 version. Okay, great. I think um, they all have everything that they need. So guys, you know, just check out for your emails. We'll be sending out all these links, the discount codes for the books. And also we'll be giving you our live trading room video series as well that you can then also look into and also import and integrate everything that Steve has talked about. I think if there are no other um, questions then coming in, I think we will include um, for now. Um, Steve, and I think you've mentioned everything so much for your time today. It's been such a pleasure. We really enjoyed it. And I'm sure all the others would have found incredible, tremendous value from today's session. Thank you so much, Steve. You're very welcome. And thank you for the invite. It's great to connect again. Thanks, Thierry. Thank you. And as we always say, till the next time, stay disciplined, follow your trading plan and keep trading like a master. Bye, everyone.